welcome to the presentation. Previously in part one, we covered phases of insulin secretion. In part two, we'll go through insulin resistance and beta cell dysfunction. I highly recommend going through part one. It'll help in understanding part two. The link will be in the description below and also in the corner up here. Let's begin. Part two, insulin resistance. Let's look at the contributing factors for insulin resistance. So there are various mechanisms that are involved. It can include genetics, it can include metabolic syndrome, but one of the major contributors is obesity. With obesity, remember, there is excessive growth of adipose tissue or fat tissue due to overconsumption or excessive intake of calories. This leads to increase of the fat tissue. And as we see here on the side, the side view here, the fat there is subcutaneous fat and there's also visceral fat. The visceral fat is the fat that wraps around organs within the abdominal cavity. And this fat is very important here. With visceral fat, there is an increase in uh, secretion of inflammatory mediators, such as adipokines and pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha. We'll look at these in a little bit more detail. Let's look at the pro-inflammatory mediators that impact insulin signaling. So the diagram we have here is just for information purposes. It's just to show the various downstream messengers involved, as well as how complex it actually is. So this is the PIK3 AKT signaling pathway, and this helps to regulate this process here. So we have insulin here, and when it binds to its receptor, we get a cascade of events and a host of uh, secondary messengers, downstream messengers. And these downstream messengers play a role in, as we highlighted earlier, protein synthesis within, within the muscle and the liver, glucose transport in muscle and fat cells. So remember, remember the GLUT4 transporter plays a pivotal role here. We get, we get glycogenesis in the muscle and the liver, gluconeogenesis in the liver, as well as lipogenesis in the liver and the fat cell. Let's turn our attention to this receptor here. So this is where the pro-inflammatory mediators will bind. So TNF-alpha, interleukin-6, when they bind, they also trigger a cascade of events and downstream messengers. These downstream messengers impair, impede on the, all of insulin's uh, secondary messengers as well. When this happens, this actually will jeopardize these mechanisms here, affecting protein synthesis, glucose transport, glycogenesis, gluconeogenesis, and lipogenesis. So here we have a diagram of insulin's various mechanisms within the cell. So this is a hypothetical cell. So we have the liver right here, and then we have the muscle and fat cell here. So within the muscle and fat cell, we have the insulin receptor, and insulin binds to its receptor. When this happens, there is a cascade of signal transduction events that occurs, and there's multiple downstream messengers that are involved. There's many of them. We won't go through them. We'll just uh, term it as downstream messengers. So these downstream messengers will have impact here, that they will cause the GLUT4 vesicles that contain the GLUT4 transporters to embed themselves in the cell membrane. This allows glucose from the blood to enter into the cell, which will help to bring down our blood glucose levels. Next is that we have the uh, this transporter here, where the secondary messengers also play a role, is that this transporter will allow the amino acids and fatty acids to enter into the cell. This will allow for protein synthesis within the muscle and lipogenesis in the fat cell. Glucose will also go into storage, so we have glycogenesis, glucose to glycogen, which will occur in the liver and the muscle as well. On the liver, there's the GLUT2 transporter. Remember, this is, this is an insulin-independent transporter. It doesn't rely on insulin for its mode of action. It's active when our blood glucose levels are high, such as after we eat. Uh, when our blood glucose levels are high, glucose will enter into, into the cell and either be put as, used as energy or it can be put as storage. Now, the point here is that these downstream messengers play a critical role in many of these processes. If anything impedes or impairs these downstream messengers, multiple uh, mechanisms are being impacted. So protein synthesis, lipogenesis, glycogenesis, as well as glucose transport into the cell. Let's go to the next slide and look at this in a little more detail. So here we have the diagram that we saw earlier of insulin's various mechanisms within the cell. So when we have the pro-inflammatory mediators impacting or impeding on our downstream messengers, this, this will lead to a chain of events. So this will impact our GLUT4 vesicles that have the GLUT4 transporters, which in turn will affect them embedding themselves into the cell membrane. So this will impact our glucose transport into the cell. Furthermore, this will affect our amino acid and fatty acid transport into the cell, 
affecting protein synthesis as well as lipogenesis. The downstream messengers also play a role with our glycogenesis, so this will also be impacted. Let's turn our attention uh, back to the GLUT4 transporter. So as I mentioned, if it's not embedding itself into the cell membrane, glucose is not going to, going to be able to enter into the cell. So glucose will build up in the blood, leading to hyperglycemia. The pancreas will try to compensate by releasing more insulin to compensate for these uh, high glucose levels. So we get hyperglycemia and we also get hyperinsulinemia. So we can see from this diagram that insulin signaling has been impacted as well as the insulin sensitive glucose transport has also been impaired. All right, so let's summarize insulin resistance and what we know so far. So we understand the mechanism behind it as we have seen in the previous slides. We know those pro-inflammatory mediators play a key role in impairing insulin signaling within the cell. This uh, affects uh, various mechanisms within the cell, especially the GLUT4 transporter. And this, remember, plays a key role in glucose transport from the blood into the cell. When this is impacted, our blood glucose levels increase, leading to hyperglycemia. All right, so now let's move on to beta cell dysfunction and see the mechanism behind this and how this affects insulin release. Let's look at the contributing factors for beta cell dysfunction. So we know with glucose, when it's not being efficiently taken up by the target tissues, there's more glucose in the blood, leading to hyperglycemia. The pancreas will increase its insulin output to compensate for this hyperglycemia, but to a certain point. Let's take a look at the diagram here. So here we have a pancreatic beta cell. And on the pancreatic beta cell, we have a GLUT2 transporter. Remember, the GLUT2 transporter is insulin independent. It's more active when our blood glucose levels are high. So here we have high blood glucose levels or hyperglycemia occurring. So since the levels are high, the GLUT2 transporter is active, so glucose will enter the cell. Glucose uh, will go through its mechanism as we see here with the end result of insulin being released into the blood. Now, normally when our blood glucose levels uh, decline and come into, come into range, the GLU2 transporter will become less uh, active as well. So less glucose entering the cell and less insulin being released. Now the issue with the insulin resistance and the impact on the GLUT4 transporter, there's more glucose in the blood because it's not able to be transported from the blood into the cell. So we end up still with the issue of uh, high glucose levels or hyperglycemia. The pancreas will increase its insulin output almost two to three fold just to help maintain our blood glucose levels in range. Uh, and this will also lead to hyperinsulinemia increase in insulin levels in the blood. This puts more workload on the pancreas and also a lot of stress on it as well. All right, let's go to the next slide and discuss this a little bit more. So over time with chronic hyperglycemia, this causes the beta cells to become overloaded. This makes it difficult for the pancreas to keep up with the high blood glucose levels. This leads to oxidative stress and inflammation. It damages the beta cell, especially the organelles, uh, that being the mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of the cell, and also the ER, or the endoplasmic reticulum, and remember, the ER plays a key role in insulin synthesis. This leads to beta cell dysfunction and apoptosis, or cell death, and eventually leading to a gradual loss of beta cell function and mass. When there's a loss of beta cell function and mass, there's going to be less insulin secreted. And when there's not enough insulin, this will lead to the blood glucose levels not being adequately controlled, eventually leading to progression of the disease. Here's a summary flowchart of what we covered so far on the defects in insulin secretion. So we know that with obesity and increase in visceral fat, there's release of pro-inflammatory mediators. And we know these pro-inflammatory mediators impair insulin sensitivity of target tissues such as the muscle, the fat, and the liver. So basically this, uh, the tissues are not able to respond to the insulin adequately. And this impacts the GLUT4 transporters as well. So this affects glucose being transported from the blood into the cell. If there's more glucose in the blood, this is going to lead to hyperglycemia. This puts chronic stress on the pancreas to increase its insulin output to control this hyperglycemia. When we put both this together, we get oxidative stress and damage to the beta cells. Over time, this is going to lead to beta cell destruction and failure and decrease in the beta cell mass. When there's less beta cell mass, this will lead to decrease in insulin secretion. When there's less insulin to control our blood glucose levels, this will lead to hyperglycemia. Eventually over time, if this, is, if this is not properly managed, this will lead to progression of the disease. One more thing to add here is that the loss of beta cell function 
occurs well before the onset of type 2 diabetes. Furthermore, the insulin resistance can precede the development of type 2 diabetes by 10 to 15 years. So a person may have beta cell dysfunction, insulin resistance, and not even be aware of it. And this is why screening is so important for type 2 diabetes. By detecting early, we can implement management treatment strategies to help slow the progression. All right, that concludes the presentation on insulin resistance and beta cell dysfunction. I hope you found this video helpful. Don't forget to subscribe for more videos. And again, thanks for watching.